Hello, my name is Bennett Schwartz. I'm a professor in the psychology department here at FAU, as well as one of the professors teaching IDH 1001. Though my main research area is human memory, I've done some original research in the area of psycholinguistics. I won't talk about that research today, but we'll give what I hope is a broad overview of the field of linguistics, which will be our focus for most of the next month. Language is critical to our understanding of the world, of others, and ourselves. Indeed, much of what we know about the world and ourselves, for that matter, is because someone told us. So what is language? We say it like we know it, but what does it mean? Is sign language a language? Is body language language? Does your dog understand language? Moreover, if we assume we know something about language, who defines what a language is? Why am I speaking in the way I do with the words I do at this particular moment in time? What would you do or say if I was speaking in Bahasa Indonesian or Navajo uh, instead of what we might agree is English? Finally, how much does language in general and the languages we know individually affect the way we think, feel, and act, if at all? Would you be a different person if you spoke a different language? In this presentation, I'll be talking a bit about the evolution of language how languages serve as a medium for communication and as a medium for individual thought. I will touch on some of the topics David Harrison will address in particular, uh, the common features of language and how they differ, but mostly I'm going to focus on uh, biological and cultural evolution of language. So what was the first language? Was there an ancestral language to all languages today? Or did language evolve independently among different human populations? We'll never really know. But we do know that, that languages today fall into big groups of common ancestry. In the past, people have argued that the first language was Hebrew, because it's the language of the Bible, Aramaic, because it was Jesus' native tongue, Chinese, because of its long history, um, or even Phrygian. The Egyptians thought it was Phrygian. So the relevant data to this debate as to the origins of human language is that about 60,000 years ago, there was a cultural burst in human and human beings. There was the development of, of art, of music. First art uh, tended to be body art, tattoos and, and earrings. Um, and the, this sort of beginnings of culture. So this cultural burst about 60,000 years ago is often taken as evidence that language is relatively recently evolved. There is some evidence that Neanderthals, who've been around for half a million years before that time period, may have had the rudiments of language. In fact, areas of their brain associated with language uh, were larger than would be expected if they didn't have language. So there is evidence that language may exi have existed in human beings for much longer than that early estimate. Um, in the middle is recent research coming from genetics that shows that there are genes that appear to be unique in distinguishing our language abilities. Uh, these genes are different from uh, related genes in non-human species. And these genes uh, trace back to about 200,000 years ago for a common ancestor, which suggests sort of an in-between origin of language. What is pretty certain is that these big changes in language happened prior to the distribution of languages across the globe, so that all of us share a unique um, ancestry in language. Uh, and evidence of this is the fact is that any human being born to any race or culture or ethnicity, um, if then raised in another uh, ling linguistic community, would develop that other language perfectly normal as a native speaker. Um, another evidence for sort of common ancestry of language is, comes from neuroscience. And in all human beings, you find that the same areas of the brain are used in language, regardless of what language you speak or where you come from or what your ethnicity is. And these areas are Broca's area in the front of the brain and the frontal lobe of the brain, which is associated with the production of speech, uh, with fluent speech, and in sign language, with the ability to move one's hands uh, to make the fluent speech of sign language, and an area in the back of the brain, the temporal lobe, called Wernicke's area, which is associated with language comprehension. In people who use spoken language, it's uh, comprehension of spoken speech. In people who use manual sign languages, this area is associated with 
the understanding of visual sign hand movements to comprehend language. And this is true regardless of the language that people speak. We also know that language must be relatively uh, recent because when we look at non-human primates, like these guys, uh, apes, um, these are remarkably clever and intelligent animals who can do uh, amazingly interesting things. Uh, this uh, bonobo chimpanzee down here in the left corner uh, was once stopped by the uh, Georgia State Police for um, a driving infraction on a road in Atlanta. Um, so remarkably good at problem solving, tool use, but aside from developing some symbolic representation of symbols to spoken words or symbols to written words, they fail to develop the kinds of language abilities that you would see in even a two-year-old human being. So the evidence from non-human primates suggests that language is a unique aspect to human beings and therefore is probably of a more recent evolutionary origin. As we switch from biological evolution to cultural evolution, there are a couple of thing, points that must be made. First of all, biological evolution of language is very difficult uh, to investigate because uh, language doesn't fossilize, and the best we can do are these sort of uh, distributions of genes in the uh, current population. Cultural evolution of language, uh, we have a better sort of handle on because at least over the last five or six thousand years, there are written records, and over the last a hundred years, visual records of how people spoke in earlier time periods. So one of the things that we know about human language is that language evolves quickly. Uh, in fact, in many non-literate languages, some of the languages that uh, Professor Harrison will be talking about next week, um, languages change so quickly that grandchildren can't understand what their grandparents are saying and grandparents can't understand what their grandchildren are saying. Um, in sort of the big languages that most of us are familiar with, from English to Spanish to uh, Mandarin to uh, Hindi to other sort of uh, European languages that have been written down for a long time. Language and visual media slow the change of language. Uh, so relative to a non-literate uh, language, that uh, English-speaking grandchild is going to have a lot better opportunities to understand what their grandparents are saying. But all you have to do is go back and watch a movie from the 1930s or 40s, and you will see the way in which language has changed, even in English, uh, and with its literate uh, visual media culture, over uh, a relatively short time period. Um, but one of the things you'll see in, in Harrison's discussion is this cultural ev evolution of languages actually works much faster in non-literate languages. So one of the questions we can ask is, was there an ancestral language, a language that precedes all languages and from which all languages have sprung? And some people call this the proto-human language, the first language uh, from which all our languages have uh, derived. Um, at this point, it will be impossible to ever really answer this question for sure, but we, what we do know is that most of the languages uh, that people speak today, in fact, the uh, vast majority of people speak these languages called Indo-European languages, uh, which started about five or 6,000 years ago as what's called Proto-Indo-European, uh, which was a language sp spoken on the steppes of southern Russia and what's now Kazakhstan. And these people who were herders and nomadic uh, horsemen spread first south into what is now Iran and Persia, bringing their languages with them, where they met up with already literate cultures in the Middle East, Semitic cultures in the Middle East who were already uh, uh, writing and reading. So some of this is uh, documented in those records. So they spread south into what's now Iran. They spread east and then south into India, and languages like Hindi and Urdu are considered Indo-European languages. And then they also sp spread west into Western Europe, bringing these languages with them. And most of, sort of our, the languages we're familiar with today, from English to Spanish to French to German, are all descendants of this ancestral uh, Proto-Indo-European language. How do we know this? Well, here's the spread of 
uh, Proto-Indo-European languages today from India across to Ireland and of course many of these languages have spread to the New World, Spanish and Portuguese in South America, Spanish and French and English in North America, but we don't see that on the map. What you can see in this thing here, in this slide here, is some common words that are common to all languages and what you can see is in these Indo-European languages, you have very similar constructions for the words across the Indo-European languages, from English to Spanish down to Urdu, Latin, Sanskrit. And from these different words, what linguists have able to do is extract what was likely the word in Proto-Indo-European, something like Bruta, um, from which all these other uh, words uh, began. And then if you contrast that with two languages here, Hebrew and Tag Tagalog, which are not Indo-European languages, you can see that the words are very different and don't fit the pattern. And you can find this for a great many sort of common words in each of these languages, which we might think of being very different, um, but you can see the commonalities uh, when they're put across here and how different they are from the Hebrew and Tagalog words. So Proto-Indo-European was this language that then changed as it morphed into different places. And one of the things that you see as it changes in different places, as for example, as it spread into India and beca becomes Hindi, uh, the pr these Proto-Indo-Europeans needed words for things that were tropical. No tropics on the steppes of Russia, right? So they needed things that were tropical, and from those they borrowed from languages that were already present on the Indian subcontinent uh, to come up with the terms for uh, tropical things. And if we put up a list of Hindi tropical words, mango, things like that, you wouldn't find uh, the commonality with the other languages. So to focus on just a little bit on this concept of how languages interact with each other, I'm going to do just a very brief history of our own language, English. Uh, one of the nice things about English for linguists is it's been recorded in written format and later in video format uh, almost from uh, the beginning of the language. So if you can imagine yourself back in what is now England and now London in the year 410 AD, you would find that England is inhabited by a Celtic people named Britons. Um, the Britons were loyal to Rome, they were loyal Roman subjects, they were Christian, and they were literate in Latin. Uh, their Celtic language had some uh, forms of writing, but most of them preferred uh, Latin for writing. But around, in 410, the Romans withdrew, they could no longer defend uh, the Brit British Isle, and that left these Celtic people uh, vulnerable to attack. And sure enough, the Angles and the Saxons invaded shortly after the Romans left, bringing with them their Germanic language, uh, their Germanic origin languages, which they had been speaking uh, in what's now the Netherlands. Um, recent genetics studies show that although the language change was pretty complete, there's very little left of Celtic in English, um, the genetic change was was not that great, and most people of English ancestry are Celtic genetically, but speaking a Germanic language. Once the Angles and Saxons got settled in, they too became the subject to uh, attack from other areas. The Angles and Saxons had driven Celtic people to the north and to the west, um, but then Norse people from what's now Scandinavia uh, attacked, and bringing with them uh, their version of Germanic language, and from uh, Old Norse, we get lots of sort of very common English words like skin, anger, bag, skill, anything with a sk sound is most likely from uh, Old Norse in English. So um, the Vikings eventually settled in and uh, became regular English speaking people. And then the next people that you have to worry about were the Norman French who invaded in 1066. The Normans were actually ethnically uh, Scandinavian, but had picked up the language of France. And they brought Fran French, as spoken in 1066 in Normandy, to uh, England. And French became the language of the nobility in England for about 300 years. Um, so during this time period, there was a lot of borrowing from French into English, because French was the language of 
people in charge. So many words that we have today, which also seem very sort of ordinary English words, actually have a French origin. Fancy foods, beef, pork, fruit, salmon, uh, things about higher culture, fashion, dress, art, painting, romance, all came from uh, French at that time. French would influence English later, and so you often have two words, both of French origin, that mean something very similar. Later in England, during the 16th and 17th century, Latin was the prestige language, still, uh, the language of science, the language of government, the language of religion, and a lot of terms, uh, especially for science, were taken from Latin and put into English. So one of my favorite examples of this is Often, without even meaning, without even knowing the origins of word, our words, how many of us actually know the etymology of the words we speak? But when we want to sound sophisticated, we often tend to use words that are of Latinate origin in English. So if I wanted to sound sophisticated about a crime, I might say, the juveniles affected entry into the domicile and absconded with various materials. Put it in a southern accent, and it actually sounds funny. The juveniles affected entry into the domicile and absconded with various materials. Uh, sounds like a sheriff trying to sound sophisticated. All of these words, except for into and the, are of Latinate origin. You could say the same sentence with words of Germanic origin, and it wouldn't nearly sound as uh, sophisticated or as false sophisticated. The kids broke into the house and stole some stuff. Here we have all words of Germanic origin, and the sentence sounds a lot more plain or simple. And you can see that uh, throughout uh, English construction. You want to sound folksy, you say, um, we were born free. Uh, you want to sound presidential, you say, conceived in liberty. The first phrase is Germanic, the second phrase is Latin. Okay. Um, Languages continue to change and evolve, and the most recent changes that you see in the English language um, come not so much from the conquerors, but in some cases the conquerees. Um, so you see a lot of uh, Hindi now entering English, and has been for uh, quite some time. Some common words uh, like pajama and pariah are of Hindi origin. Uh, Native American words have greatly influenced English. Um, some common ones here, like raccoon and pecan, we don't even think of as being having to do with Native Americans anymore. And then some more ones like papoose, which I think still have some connotations. And also Spanish uh, has been uh, heavily influenced in English over the last uh, couple hundred years. Um, older word like alligator has been around for a while, but derives from Spanish. A more recent word like taco. Um, tomato actually is a Native American word that entered Spanish, and then from Spanish it entered English. So languages continue to evolve, and you can see um, in English this sort of pattern of change over the years. In fact, if you went back and spoke to somebody who was speaking English in the year uh, 1000, they would sound completely incomprehensible. It would be a different, uh, a different language altogether. So, um, cultural evolution of language can happen very rapidly, and, it's cha and the change is inevitable. Uh, so, final thing to think about, uh, especially before uh, the visit of Dr. Harrison next week, is one, make sure you read the book. Uh, second is think about how your language and the languages that you speak affect the way you think and affect the way uh, you interact with the world on a daily basis. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, video presentation and thanks for listening, or thanks in Esperanto.